I'm going to share a few things from God's Word today because it's kind of my job. But there's also some other things that I think are really important to talk about. Um, one is that we've really been on a pretty crazy journey in a short amount of time. I know that. It's, it's really been really neat. And I'm so thankful to be with you in that journey and to do these things. Um, I think it's truly a blessing that um, uh, Jess is going to be involved with us as well as one of your pastors. That's really cool. God has gifted us in very different ways, which I think is really balancing. And uh, we, we look forward to harmoniously. I wrote that down. I wanted to say it right. Harmoniously working together with our giftings uh, for you. It's for the church. That's the point is to do that. This is probably a really good time to share a few ministry announcements so that you kind of know where we're heading and what I, I really want to see us do as a church. Um, all of it really aligns with where we've been uh, preaching and talking and discussing as a body of Christ, and uh, you'll notice that in how we do it. So the first thing I want to mention is Family Day, Monday, February 19th. At 10 a.m., I want us to do a brunch together here at the church if you're available to do that, and a board game time as well. Don't get syrup on your board games. That's a thing. So bring stuff that you don't mind sharing and playing with friends. It is a BYO board game, so bring your own. And uh, we'll have some time together to play, hang out. It's family day. You got other plans? Pop in, have some brunch, 10 a.m., and play some games. It should be a good time to just gather together and have some fun. You, you don't have to have your family here. This is your family, so please come and enjoy that with us. We're not restricting you, all right? So um, that's good. You can, we'll probably do a little bit of a sign up so we know who's coming when. I don't know. You can call, but like we're just going to get a lot of food and it's going to be a lot of fun. So just, just show up. It'll be good. We got this. We can do that. We can wake up, whip up some more pancakes if we see that, you know, people are banging down the doors or coming through the windows. Um, don't come through the windows. They don't open uh, very easily and they're very small. Okay. Next thing I want to say, after that day, because it's family day, right? That's Monday the 19th. After that day, we're going to start something on Wednesday evenings at 6.30, about an hour long. I'm long-winded. I'm going to try. Uh, but the idea is this. From 6.30 to 7.30, we think that's fairly family-friendly, especially for those who travel and whatever else. We're not providing a meal. You can eat your dinner. But on Wednesdays, from that day and every Wednesday can, uh, forward, we want to have a family night together. And this is what I want to do with that time. I want us to have a time of worship and prayer, study, discussion, and fellowship. And it's for your entire family. I was raised in a blessed situation where I was able to see my parents pray. I was able to be with the church when we worshiped. I was able to understand my faith and where it goes after Sunday school with everyone together. And I think that's important. I don't care if your kid's a little loud. I don't care if they fall asleep in the seats. I slept in many a pew in my day and woke up with drool on my face. Are we praying? Are we going on? Are we done? And, you know, and they let me stand with them and sing really old hymns and pray, and it was cool. The thing is, I want us to be unified as a family of God and see everyone as equal. So we're going to do that together, okay? And I want us to have discussions. We're going to chat about things. We're going to bump into each other and have, you know, fellowship time. But we're going to discuss God's word, and we're going to pray together, and we're going to worship a little bit. So these are all things I want us to do within the hour. I don't want it to be boring for the kids, so we're going to have some fun. But I also don't want it to be elementary for you because maybe you've been here a long time and you want to grow. So we're going to actually work in a way to make sure that that occurs, okay? So Wednesday the 21st is the first one, and then we're going to keep those rolling for a while. Will we make adjustments to make sure that it's tweaked and working good? Yeah, we will. We're not just going to leave it and say, well, I said this is how it works and that's the end of it. No, we want it to make sense. The other thing I'll mention is uh, you're probably wondering, okay, well, what's the next thing after that? Well, I definitely want to get this home base working well because community events are really important, community outreach. The church is already going to be doing some of those things on the side, as you know, that's not changing. But um, we want to add to that in the future. But I believe this. If you want to show the community God and what you have to offer in your Christian walk. I want us to get there first as a body. To lead someone to a place you've never been is not a good idea. We're going to understand each other, our place, God's calling in our lives, study together, pray together, worship together, and that's going to equip us for the next. Sound good? 
So we'll add that in in a little bit. So don't worry, that's not been forgotten. That is the mandate of the church, and we know it. Uh, I'm not starting a men's thing or a women's thing or a small groups thing right away. I'm getting us together first. I want us to start off working being together. That's really important, but I am very excited for all those things in the future. I am. That's, it's not off my radar. It's on my radar. It's just a little bit further than this one that's coming in for a landing, okay? So that's the idea, and I want to make sure that I talk the pilot down because they're probably nervous. Uh, so that's, that's where we're going, and I'm very excited about it. God's been so good to us as a church. And as a spiritual family, this is wonderful stuff. Let's get to our scripture today. We're going to read from the Old Testament again. I know. I just sometimes I really just get into this and I love the stories and what it teaches us. And uh, we're going to go to 2 Chronicles 14. 2 Chronicles is uh, a neat thing, uh, just to get you some background on what's happening um, in the scripture. Uh, it, it's behind me, and that's good because I want you to know why this is written, why this comes to pass, why we're even here reading this passage today. So this chronicles the kings of two kingdoms, Judah and Israel. Now, Israel, you know, was a nation founded by God. Uh, Selena read this morning about Moses. Moses led people out of slavery in Egypt, brought them into um, a place where they wandered the wilderness, waiting to go and conquer the new promised land to them, promised way back even to Abraham long before, generations before and they definitely took the detour. But when they got there, God established them in this beautiful nation, in this beautiful land. And um, they were called Israel, this full nation with many tribes. And uh, they had judges. We talked about Gideon a few, uh, I was going to say years ago, um, weeks ago. I've been here a while. Um, now, it's, it's, we've talked about Gideon. He was one of those judges who kind of brought people back to God in his knowledge and understanding and freed them from enemies that were oppressing them. But eventually, the nation of Israel said, you know, everybody else got kings. We want kings too. So God was like, whatever, uh, fine. Uh, how about that guy? He's bigger than everybody else. That sounds good. And they, they picked out a dude named Saul. It went fine uh, for a while, and then not so fine. And then there was this God-chosen elected person named David, King David. He's pretty famous. Maybe you heard of him. He's a musician, so I think he's cool. Um, and he, he had the nation in a really sweet spot. He took care of it and did a really good job. He then gave it to his son, um, Solomon, who prayed for wisdom, and God gave him an abundance of wisdom. He decided to write a bunch of it down in this book we call the Bible, but there's more, I'm sure. He just had a lot of wisdom. God gave it to him because he asked for it. And then things got dicey. So there's like a botched su succession plan that occurred and everything just started to fall apart. And as that started to happen and people fell away from what God really wanted for the nation, it got split, this nation, into a northern kingdom called Israel, they kept the name, and then the southern kingdom of Judah because Judah actually was the tribe that David came from and they named it after that tribe. Benjamin was kind of like there, like, can I hang out? Oh, yeah. Um, it's in the Bible. Uh, so they are then this southern kingdom. Now, the reason why I want to share all this with you is because when they started chronicling the kings and what happened, there's this split. There's a split, right? There's northern and southern. And, and we're going to read about a guy named Asa. King Asa was king of Judah, okay? And Judah had some good kings, and some not so good kings. They had good times and bad times. Israel only had bad kings. <laughs> so be it. Uh, but what's really neat, and I won't quote it today, I just think it's a real special thing, is God loved David so much and this promise he gave to David saying, I will sustain your line. That the reason why Judah had good kings at all was just to keep it a little bit alive because of the promise he made to David. God and his promises, eh? 
So good. That's a whole thing. I won't get into it, but that's amazing. So anyway, uh, the books of First and Second Chronicles are ancient Jewish texts. They were used to chronicle the kings, and we're going to uh, touch on Asa. He would have ruled Judah around 911 to 870 B.C., and we're going to read about him in the passages behind me. And yeah, I'm still going to read from the NIV. Sorry, uh, it's going to be a little different. But nonetheless, if you have a Bible with you, you can read along as well. It says this. Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord, his God. He removed the foreign altars and high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He condemned, or commanded, he commanded Judah to seek the Lord the God of their ancestors, and to obey his laws and commands. He removed the high places and incense altars in every town of Judah, and the kingdom was at peace under him. He built up the fortified cities of Judah since the land was at peace. No one was at war with him during those years, for the Lord gave him rest. Sounds like Ace is a pretty good king, right? Out of all the kings, this is one of those good ones. I'm going to jump right into an application for you today because I think it's important that we start here. Um, you were created for good works. You were created for good works. Like King Asa of Judah, you were called to do something for God with your life. You were. And I hope you know that because that something is meant to be good. It's meant to be good. Good for you, good for the body of Christ, which is the church, good for your family, good for the world at large. You're meant to do good. You were created for good works. The second thing that I want you to know is that you were meant to know rest. You're meant to know rest. The last verse I just read in my version says this, no one was at war with him during those years, for the Lord gave him rest. Gave him rest. True rest only comes from God. You're not finding it anywhere else. And the world wants to give you a lot of options of what rest looks like, but it only comes from God. If you want it, do his work. I'll say that again. If you want rest, true rest, do God's work. And that might spark two questions in you, and I hope it does, because I'm going to answer them anyway. <laughs> Question number one is this, okay? Question number one might be this. Maybe you're thinking this. I don't know. Maybe you are. What do you mean work brings rest? Doesn't rest bring rest? That makes sense, right? Work brings rest? Second question might be this. We've talked about spiritual warfare here before, so I'm not hiding that. What about this question? If I do God's work, doesn't Satan attack me, therefore I become restless? If I'm doing God's work, God's will, wouldn't the enemy of our souls want to push at me and bother me and hurt me? Let's do one question at a time. Let's talk about, doesn't, what do you mean work brings rest? Doesn't rest bring rest? I'm going to read a passage that's really you know, famous, you know it. And I'm going to read it in two versions. I'll start with NIV. It's Matthew 11, verses 28 and 30. If you have your Bible with you, you can turn to it as well. It's going to be behind me. And this is what it says in Matthew 11. This is Jesus speaking. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How many know that passage of scripture? Right. Yeah, we memorize this. We study this a lot of the time, uh, even in Sunday school. Maybe they're talking about it today. Wouldn't that be crazy? Uh, I don't know if they are. Uh, but nonetheless, I want to read this one more time. I'm going to read it in the message translation. I have to say this. I like some specific passages in the message translation. And it's kind of neat to read, but it's not my core translation where I want to glean from what God is really saying. But it's neat to kind of read some of the things to get another perspective, which I think is a healthy way to do it. Reading different translations is really cool. So this is what the message actually says, and I like what it says. Jesus speaking. Are you tired, worn out, 
burnt out on religion, come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Isn't that beautiful? That's cool. And I have no issue with that. There's something special about this. See, Jesus has us work with him. He says, come work with me and I'll show you rest. So work has rest involved. Uh, If you're thinking I'm not employed, because maybe you're not. Yes, you are. You have work to do in this life for the kingdom of God. The pay is trash, but the benefits are pretty good. God has something for you and you need to just lend an ear to his voice in your life. He wants you to know that he has work for you. And only in that work will you find true rest with him. Question two was, if I do God's work, doesn't Satan attack me and therefore I am restless? Well, this is actually best answered in our passage of scripture that we've been reading with King Asa. It depends on the work. It depends on the work. If you are reaching the lost, healing the sick, loving one another, and being Jesus to a broken, hurting world, well, Satan doesn't like that. He doesn't like that. We know that he doesn't like that. He wants the world for himself. He wants to corrupt it, corrupt you, and hurt others around you, sometimes with you, sometimes with the people that you love. That's a bummer, but it's a thing. But that's not the work that Asa was doing. Asa was doing something significant. So let's read what he did. I'm going to read verse 3 and 5 from what we just read. So here it is. He removed the foreign altars in high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. These are all false gods, demonic things that they would have worshipped in the land of Judah. He smashed and got rid of them, gutted them, and threw them out. Verse 5 said, He removed the high places and incense altars in every town of Judah, and the kingdom was at peace under him. Okay, the work of driving out evil from your life and the lives of those that you care about scares Satan. He doesn't want anything to do with you then. If you're doing the good thing of Jesus to others, you have to understand, Jesus was declared son of God when he came out of the water and was baptized and then he was in the wilderness and he was tempted by Satan. And then after that, he said, you know, be gone. I got this. And Satan left. And his ministry, therefore, was just watching Satan fall. He would pray and the demonic were relieved. He prayed and people were healed. He did all that work. So here's the thing. When you're doing that, something special happens. You're specifically targeting the enemy and getting him out of your life. You're cutting down the Asherah poles. You're removing the high places of incense unto false gods in your life. You do that and you will find peace and rest. It's not just about let's do God's work. Let's actually realize that there's a warfare for our lives and push the enemy back too. Right? James 4, 7, I'm sure you know this. It says, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Resist isn't just stand there and take it. Resist means fight back, get him out of your life. And he'll flee from you because he can't handle the power of God within you. He can't. So, application time again. You are created for good works. You're created for good works, to be Christ-like in your goodness toward your family, community, and church, and be watchful for sin and evil desires that creep up in your life, and you need to knock them down and remove them from your routine, your household, and your speech. Get them out. You don't need signs of the enemy in your life. You don't. And if you remove them, then your rest comes from doing the good works. It's true. You work with Jesus, you will find that rest. That's how you truly find true rest. It's what we're all looking for, church, and I know it. But it takes work with Christ, and it takes removing the enemy from your life. So King Asa actually had 35 years of good fortune, of peace in his land, 
well, not really peace. He went to war, but he like rocked it. He won and he took care of his people and they were all established. They were safe and protected and, and they were really, really good. But then something happened. Something happened. And I'm going to paraphrase uh, chapter uh, 15 a bit. But a siege came. Um, a siege is when you surround a city, but they actually blocked off the country. Um, and uh, they, there was uh, a king of Aram, which is their enemy. And uh, he partnered with the kingdom of Israel to the north, who shouldn't be their enemy. This is God's chosen people too, right? But bad kings, bad choices. So they partner together and they block off Judah, this kingdom that Asa is king of. And no one can go in or out and they're kind of suffering. They're not doing great from this siege. So after all that he's done and his 35 years of victory and peace, Asa makes a decision. And he says, I think I know what I can do. I'm going to take the gold and silver. During his knocking down of all these evil places, he took all the gold and silver from those places and he put them in the temple of God. And he just wanted to glorify God and have them there to display his love unto God Almighty. He ended up taking at this time the gold and the silver out of the temple of God. He gave it as a gift to the king of Aram and said, hey, would you help me overthrow Israel and get them out of my way. We want victory over this land and us to be free from the siege. And Aram, the king of Aram's like, yeah, that's sure. I'll take all your money. <laughs> Sounds good. It's a good deal for me. So he does that and uh, he wins. His land is now open and he did his kingly thing. Problem was that he did a few things wrong one is, being king of Israel, you want to seek God as your main guide in helping you do the right thing. He took the things from God's house. He gave it to the enemy, and he didn't even try to partner with the kingdom of Israel, who are his brothers and sisters in this whole thing. Didn't do it. He did it two ways wrong. Three, if you count, they didn't consult God. So... God sends a prophet or a seer, in my scripture it says seer, a prophet to Asa to tell him what he did was wrong. He said, this is wrong. Obviously, this isn't the way you do things. And here's the part of the message from the prophet of the seer that uh, transpired afterwards. It says in 2 Chronicles, this is chapter 16, verses 9 to 13. This is what happened next. Verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord, and this is the seer speaking, the prophet speaking, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. You have done a foolish thing, and from now on, you will be at war. He had rest before church. He had peace, but now something's changed. I'll read that again because it's significant. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. You have done a foolish thing, and from now on you will be at war. Okay, verse 10. Asa was angry with the seer because of this. He was so enraged that he put him in prison. At the same time, Asa brutally oppressed some of his people. I thought you were a good king, bro. Anyway, verse 11. The events of Asa's reign from beginning to end are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. In the 39 year, uh, 39th year of his reign, Asa was afflicted with a disease in his feet. Though his disease was severe, even in his illness, he did not seek help from the Lord, but only from the physicians. Then, in the 41st year of his reign, Asa died and rested with his ancestors. Again, it's a log of what he went through. So Asa, unfortunately, the rest didn't last, unfortunately. And that's really a shame because we can see in retrospect, hindsight's 2020, that he could have had rest if he, obe if he was obedient. Or even if he repented and said, I'm sorry, that was wrong, I'll try to fix it. We've seen that. Like, remember when I put King David on a pedestal? That dude did wrong things a lot. A lot. 
he always wanted to seek the heart of God and he would repent and lay himself before the Lord. So I'm not telling you to be perfect. I'm telling you to own your stuff and bring it to God and say, I'm sorry. That's important too, right? Okay, so here's the thing. My last point is this, how to make the rest last. How do we make it last? Well, ironically, I think it's ironic. Rest, rest actually is short for restoration. Rest is short for restoration. Rest isn't always about feeling good. Rest is about healing. When you're sick and you need your rest, you're usually achy and in pain and laying there because you can't move because your body is healing. Restoration means healing and Sometimes we think it just means, oh, I need to rest today, so I'm going to open a bottle of blah, 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 I don't know what it is, and I'm going to just chill in front of this show. I'm going to, no one talk to me. I'm going to do that. That's not rest because rest is healing. That's relaxation. Rest and relaxation are not the same thing, and we want rest in our lives. There's a time for relaxation, right? But rest comes from work, as we know earlier. So if rest is always, it is always about healing and bringing something to a place of goodness, then Asa did wrong, right, and was sent a messenger, advised him to correct him. Asa didn't listen. He threw the guy in prison and misplaced, out of misplaced anger, he oppressed his people. Asa held on to hurt and gave up on his healing. So how do we make the rest last? Well, we have to release the hurt. Because if you're holding on to something that makes you sicker, you're not getting healthier. Does that make sense? You can't keep putting poison in your body thinking that you're going to get better from the effects of the poison. So you have to release the hurt and receive the healing. Now, our healing in our context comes from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ alone. And when you're seeking healing in your life for whatever you're dealing with or going through, it can only come from him. And I pray that you seek him because he's actually given you all the tools you need. When he says, take my burden, it is light. When he says, work with me and walk with me, I will show you how to take a real rest. That's because he has the antidote. He has the help. He knows what healing is and freely wants to give it to you. But that rest comes with work and that's okay. The work is to get rid of all that other stuff in our lives like we talked about earlier. So if you release the hurt and receive the healing, then you need to walk in restoration. So Asa was afflicted in his feet. It immobilized him. It immobilized him. He couldn't move. See, proof of your healing comes when you are being mobilized. That's where the proof is. If you want to know that you are healed, that you are restored, then you will actually be doing kingdom work in this town. That's how you know you're healthy because you're out doing what God's called you to do in the first place. So you were created for good works, really good works. And I promise you that that's true to be Christ-like in your goodness towards your family, community, and church, and to be watchful for the sin and the evil desires that creep up into your life and to knock them down where in your routine, your household, and in your speech. You were meant to find rest, true rest, to work with Christ for his purposes and to be restored and healed by Christ's love, letting it permeate your entire being. His love heals, and as you accept that, you can use it. You don't have to love everybody. God will do it through you. He will. You will have a heart you did not know was there. Your healing your healing will be proven through your mobilization for God's kingdom, doing his work. And that whole thing's a message for another day. We'll get there. That's special. You can have this good life. You really, really can. You don't have to find the fate of Asa in your future. It's not there, not for anyone in this room. I don't believe that. I don't. I believe that you have a choice to seek him. And you and your household and your church can release the hurt, receive the healing, and walk in restoration. 
you believe that, church? Amen. Let's stand. We're going to pray. I want us to take a moment to do this and do this well. We're going to pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God is good, amen? Hmm. Yes, all the time. Lord God, I thank you that when you see us, you see a good work. You're very proud of us in a good way. You are our dad. You are our heavenly father. And when you see us, you say, wow, you not only have within us great gifting and love that maybe we haven't even tapped into yet. We didn't see it there, but you've placed it within. I pray we seek it out. But our potential to do great things for the kingdom of God as a team, as a family, that's when we work with you. That's when we say this is your church and we want to work with you. God, I pray that you, you help us recognize that we were meant for good. Let us see ourselves through your eyes. I say that all the time because perspective is the beginning of it all. That we would sense and know, yes, we are good. We're meant for good. I'm not bad. I may have done bad things, but haven't we all? I, like King David, repent before you, Lord, and give it to you and lay it down and say, I'm meant for good and I want to dedicate myself to good. From now on, good for my family, good for myself, good for my neighbors, good for my friends, good for my church, good for my enemies in this world, the people that I think are my enemy but really aren't. That's something I want good for, in Jesus' name. And as we seek that good, we say, enemy, stay away. We're cutting down the things in our lives that have given us the thought that we're not good enough. We're getting rid of those thoughts. We're getting rid of those images. We're getting rid of those, those words those, that on our speech, on our lips, those things, those, those things we say about ourselves and to ourselves and to the people that we actually care about. We're removing them now in Jesus' name so that they don't come off our lips anymore because we're meant for good. And when the enemy has a plan, place in our lives, we are not at peace, we are not at rest, so we're looking for rest, and we're saying, no, we're meant for good, and these things need to go. God, we just, again, repent that we even had them there in the first place, and we give them to you and get rid of them in Jesus' name. We're cutting down those poles, we're knocking down those high places where we didn't even notice, but we've been worshiping something that's not even you. God, it's yours, it's not ours anymore. And God, I thank you that we're in a place where you're reminding us that rest is restoration. Rest is a time with you where we get to do your will and it is beautiful beyond what we could ever imagine. God, I pray that you would use us for your work, Lord. Every moment we dedicate to you, we want to see you in it. God, and we would just receive this healing from it. A healing, Lord God, that we didn't even know. We didn't know we were broken in that spot in our lives. But there it is now. You shine a light on it and say, let me heal it. And God, yes, right now, yes, we say you can heal that. That's yours. I want to know what it's like to be mobilized. I want to know what it's like to move again. I didn't know I was crippled until I saw that. I thought I was moving just fine. But now you show me I can run. God Almighty, I pray that you would use us to do great things for your kingdom in this town, in this community, in our, in our workplaces, with our families. The people who don't know you, we're not there to fight them. We're there to love them and show them that there is a place for them too. Let them join the roster, join the team, join the family so that we can go do more in your name, Lord God. More in your name. Mobilize us, I pray, but you do want to start with that we're good. And that we need to get rid of the things that cause us to think otherwise. And that we can rest in you. God, help us to release the hurt, receive the healing, and walk in restoration. Oh, Lord, help us. Help us, Lord. We got to release that hurt, receive that healing. Oh, in Jesus' name, we release the hurt and receive the healing. That's what you do, and you do it well. I'm so glad that it's not by our power. We just need to yield to you to release the hurt and receive the healing. Oh, every moment I pray that this is something we recognize and see because you're doing it and you're doing a great job at it, Lord.
Thank you, Lord. As we walk in restoration, we dedicate every moment to you. It's yours, your church, your kingdom, your town. This is your message, Lord, and I thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray all these things. Amen. Amen.